I want to talk this morning, and hopefully I can get through all the material. Otherwise, I may have to come again sometime and finish. But I want to talk about, well, let me read you a verse. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Well, let, let's read back at verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God, our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down and they triumphed over him or they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. This is a famous verse about it, it's three weapons that God has given us. So we need to understand our testimony, the blood of the lamb and forsaking our life are all three weapons that we use against the enemy. There is a use of the blood against Satan. And I want to teach you how to use the blood against Satan. But before we can know how to use the blood against Satan, we need to know how to use the blood towards God. So you can put it this way. There are three arenas that the blood is applicable in. The blood is applicable first it satisfies every requirement from God. And so it's applicable to God. We use the blood to satisfy the Father. Secondly, the blood is applicable to us. We use the blood to cleanse our conscience. And thirdly, we use the blood against the enemy. And so there, the, there's the idea of the shed blood. The shed blood is what satisfies the Father. The sprinkling of blood cleanses our conscience, and the wielded blood is used against the enemy. So the blood has an application in heaven, on earth, and in hell. And if we don't understand first how to apply the blood towards the Father, if we don't understand why the Father values the blood, we're not able to utilize it in order to cleanse our own conscience. And if we can't cleanse our own conscience, we can't use it against the enemy. And so the uses of the blood are progressive. We first must understand how God values the blood so we can value the blood and we can use it against Satan. So let's pray. Father, we ask this morning that you would speak to us. Lord, I ask that you would clothe me with yourself, that you would use my words, and that you would open our ears this morning to hear from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. In order to understand why God values the blood, we have to understand Jesus' life. Let's go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 2 with me. Hebrews chapter 2. I want to read in verse, uh, let, let's read in verse 8. Well, let, let, read in verse 7. You made him a little lower than the angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor. Uh, in Psalm chapter 2, matter of fact, you go back to verse 6, the, psalm, the, the, the writer of Hebrews, whoever that was, some think it was Paul, I think it was Apollos, I, I think, uh, but whoever wrote it, he's quoting Psalm 8, and he says this, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you would visit him? You made him a little lower than the angels and put everything under his feet. And so he's talking about original creation. Matter of fact, this, this passage of Hebrews chapter 2 is a great passage to give us an overview of redemptive history. When you go to chapter, uh, when, you, when you look at the original attention, he says, God put everything under man's feet. He's quoting Psalm 8, and then he stops quoting Psalm 8 in this passage in Hebrews 2, and he adds this, yet at present... We don't see everything subject to him. Why not? Because of the fall. In creation, God delegated the earth to man. He gave us all authority. But through the fall, we abdicated our authority and we gave it away. Romans 6 says, to whom you obey, to him you were a slave. And when Adam and Eve obeyed the promptings of Satan, they gave their authority away to him. Now the enemy rules, the, 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 the devil is now called the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and the ruler of this dark age. 
Did God create him with those job titles? No. Those are dead, that, that explains his function. And it's a result of the fall, not of creation. So when God created the earth, he put everything under man's feet. But through the fall, we abdicated our authority, and now the enemy rules the world through us. So in Hebrews chapter 2, it goes on to say, yet at present we don't see everything subject to him, the fall, but we see Jesus. So he introduces the solution to the problem. The solution is the incarnation, that God became flesh. But we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels. It's saying that Jesus took on human flesh because he had to take on the role that the earth was delegated to man, so he had to save it as a man. He had to take on human flesh and come under that and win this thing back. And so he says, he, we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels. Now, let's read on here in verse probably 9 here. You made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor, put everything under his feet. And putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we don't see everything subject to him. Why? Because of the fall. Verse 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And then it goes on and it says this in verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. But the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Look, look at verse 10, it says, in bringing many sons to glory, it's fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now in this passage, it refers to Jesus as the pioneer of our salvation. Other translations call him the captain of our salvation. Uh, there's another translation that refers to him with that same word, author of our salvation, I like this translation because when it calls him the pioneer, it gives us a picture of what Jesus was doing. The first Adam, Adam in the garden, along with his wife Eve, took God's plan off course and to put humanity in the ditch. So Jesus, according to Paul, became the second Adam, took on human flesh and picked up where the first Adam left off and he was going to forge a way through the undergrowth of sin, to get us back on track to God's plan. God's plan was, to, was for more than simply you being saved. He didn't want to just convert you. God didn't save you so you could have a place in heaven alone. He saved you, not so he can take you to heaven, but so you can bring heaven to earth. You are the vehicle of his kingdom. See, Satan operates his kingdom through fallen man, and God operates his kingdom through his sons and daughters. And so God wants to manifest his kingdom through you and I. Now it says in that passage, it was fitting that God would make the author or the, uh, the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's an interesting statement. Do you realize Jesus was not perfect when he was born? That's what it says there. It says Jesus was made perfect through what he suffered. I used to be very, very puzzled by that verse. God made Jesus perfect through his suffering, according to that verse. So Jesus wasn't born perfect. He was made perfect throughout his life. Now, that does not imply that Jesus was sinful. Of course, we know he never, he never sinned. It's simply, the word perfect there means to complete. So Jesus was out to complete the original plan that God had for man. God wanted to take, to take Adam and Eve in the garden and develop them. And as they would make the right choices, they would grow in character and become like their father. 
Genesis 2.26, God says, Let us make man in our image. In the image of God made he him. Male and female made he them. So God's desire to have man in his image was a dream in God's heart. And when he declared it, that word of the Lord would not return void. He was going to have a man in his own image. When Adam failed to complete that process, God said, I'm going to come down and do this thing myself. I would propose to you that when God declared that in Genesis 2.26, let us make man in our own image, that making was a process and that image was potential. What I mean by that is Adam and Eve were not the finished product. When God put them in the garden, that was the beginning of his plan, not the end. And through moral choices, he was going to unfold his nature in them so they would grow up and manifest the image of God to the human race. But because of their sin, see, the only way that God can grow you up is through choices. You ever wonder why God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? I mean, it could have solved a lot of problems if you'd have just never put it there. And not only that, he put it in the middle of the garden. So they had to keep confronting it every day. He didn't put razor wire around it. He didn't put angels with big old rifles and pit bulls, you know, to guard the tree. He gave them free access and then told them, don't eat of it. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. The only way for us to grow is to conquer temptation. So our will has to be confronted. We have to make the right choices. And in making the right choices, we grow up. And in making the wrong choices, we get off track. And so in the economy of God, if you want to grow in God, then God's going to put you in some situations where you have to pass some tests. And if you fail the test... He just makes you take another lap around Mount Sinai and pass another, and keep taking that same test until you pass it. And so what God wants to do is he wants to grow us up. When Adam and Eve failed, Jesus came as the second Adam to, to fulfill the plan of God. Again, when God said, I will have a man in my own image, Jesus came to fulfill that word. And so Jesus was perfected by the things he suffered. You see, there's a difference between innocence and perfection. Jesus was born innocent, but he wasn't born perfect. He was sinless, but he, did, he had to have the opportunity to sin in order to be perfected. Scripture says that he was tempted in every way such as us, and once made perfect perfect he became the source of eternal salvation so he had to grow into all that God had for him this explains why God would not allow Jesus to be killed in the manger by Herod it wouldn't have been enough Jesus could not have given us full redemption had he died in the manger he had to fulfill all of righteousness you remember when he went to John his cousin John the Southern Baptist or John the Baptist he went and And uh, John's baptizing people. And Jesus presents himself and says, baptize me. And John said, no, Lord, I'm not worthy to untie your sandals. And Jesus said, I must fulfill all of righteousness. He had to do all that the Father intended for man. And by the way, if you haven't been watered, baptized, Jesus tells you it's an act of righteousness and you need to fulfill it too. That's a side note, okay? That's an advertisement for the next baptismal service. But we do, we need to be baptized. And Jesus had to fulfill all of righteousness because he was going through every test, every temptation, The only way we grow is if we're confronted with temptation and out of trust for God, we choose to do right when we have those opportunities. And the enemy is the great tempter that places things before us and says, this this is the way to get what you want. You remember when uh, the enemy came to Adam and Eve in the garden. What did he say? He said, if you eat of this fruit, 
God, you will be like God. That's what he said. Furthermore, he said that if you, the, the reason God kept it from you is because God wants to keep the good stuff, the God stuff, from you. He lied to Adam and Eve. He told them two lies. Number one, God can't be trusted because God's trying to keep the good stuff from you. Number two, you're not good enough the way you are. You better get on a self-improvement plan. You better get on a treadmill, do some push-ups, you know, lose some weight, do something to make yourself better if you want to be accepted by God. And both of those were lies. And so Adam and Eve took the lie. He, told, he made them a promise. If you eat of this fruit, you shall be as God. Now speed forward and look at Jesus in the wilderness where Adam and Eve failed eating food that God told them not to in paradise. Jesus beat the enemy in the wilderness by not eating food he could have through a 40-day fast. And the enemy came to him and said, Hey, if you worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. Both of those temptations give us insight into what temptation really is. You see, Adam and Eve were made to be like God. They were made in God's image. That was their destiny. That's what God intended. And Jesus was intended to have all the kingdoms of this world. Matter of fact, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, every nation shall come under our king, King Jesus. That is his destiny. The enemy tempted them with their destiny. The only reason temptation works is because there's something in temptation that is speaking to what God created you for. But the enemy always promises you destiny wrapped in a shortcut. He tells you, I can give you the destiny God intended, but I'll give it, you, give it to you the easy way. But God is a good father. He'll never allow us to take a shortcut. If he's going to give you something up there, that's why often God will give you a prophetic promise. You'll get a word from someone, you'll get a promise, and then all hell breaks loose for a long time, and it looks like there's no way that's going to be fulfilled. Because there's the promise, and there's the process before you get the prize. And if you don't go through the process, you won't be able to steward the prize. The very thing that God promised you in the first place you must be qualified to steward. God's too good a father. He's not going to give you something you can't handle. The enemy loves to give you things you can't handle because he knows it will destroy your life. But God never will give us something we can't handle. He'll make us a promise, awaken desire, speak to our destiny, and then he takes us through the process so that we come out the other side qualified, mature enough to handle the, the very thing that we cried out for. So God, God wants to work in us and qualify us, but he first had to do with this, this with his son. God had to have an original, a prototype. That's what Jesus was. Jesus secured the ground. He came as the second Adam. And he was tempted in every way like we were. I've had people, I remember years ago, I worked for a ministry called Teen Challenge for 14 years. And uh, it was ministry ministering to drug addicts and getting them off drugs and getting them established in their faith. And I was talking to this young man one time and he said, he said, you know, he said, I've suffered way more than Jesus ever did. He said, Jesus only suffered for a few hours on a cross. I've been suffering for 25 years. When he said that, I kind of moved my chair away, lest lightning strike. And uh, I told him, I said, I said, Jesus didn't just suffer on the cross. He lived a life of suffering. His entire life was a life of suffering. Because it was qualifying him to have all that God promised to him. And so he went through this process. That's why it says in this passage, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, made, 
the pioneer of our salvation, perfect through suffering. Why was it fitting that the pioneer, the captain, the author of our salvation was made perfect through suffering? Because that's how we're going to be made perfect, through, through suffering. I know that's not good news, but it's truth. And the quicker we understand that, the quicker we can get with the program and we can embrace it. We can begin to pass the tests rather than continually failing the tests and taking laps around Mount Sinai. And be like the Israelites who could have made it to the promised land in 12 days, but they turned it into 40 years. That is a tragedy. So what does all this have to do with the blood? Because Jesus was perfecting his life. The final test of Jesus' life was on the cross. Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus, became, Jesus was obedient even unto death, comma, even the death of the cross. Such a humiliating death. That was his final act of obedience where he trusted his father. He cried out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Fulfilling the psalm. And then he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he entrusted himself and plunged into death. The final act. What does this have to do with the blood? Well, in Leviticus, I want to say it's verse, uh, chapter 16. You'll have to look it up, I don't know. Uh, Leviticus, it says... And it's, it's reiterated in the, uh, in the New Testament. It says, the life is in the blood. Your life is in your blood. That's why it's very important you keep it. Keep your blood or you won't live. Your life is in your blood and Jesus' life was in his blood. But the value of Jesus' blood, the reason the Father valued the blood of Jesus is because in Jesus' blood... It was a completed life. It was a life that had fulfilled every righteous requirement that God ever had for man. And so when Jesus presented his blood to the Father, he was presenting God his dream. He was saying, Father, you asked for a man. You said, let us make man in your own image. And I'm going to give you that in this blood. A human life that has been perfected and has passed every test. And that's why the veil was rent. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 9. So, this is the, the first and only time this will ever happen in human history. Or the only person in human history we could say. Verse 11, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, not a part of this creation. What he's saying is that Moses got uh, blueprints from God to make a, uh, a, a, a duplicate on earth. He created the tabernacle, and there was a three-court system. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, that's not the, the, the one that Jesus went into. He went in the real one, the original. It was the throne room of God. He did not enter by means of blood, of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. That is an amazing statement. What it's saying is that Jesus went in by virtue of his own righteousness. He had earned the right to go into the Holy of Holies. He went in based on his own righteousness, by his own blood, and he presented that blood to the Father. And the Father, in essence, said, I'm satisfied. He received the blood. And it was, it was signified by the tearing of the temple veil when Jesus died. He made a way in. So, the reason God 
uh, values the blood is because it satisfies, uh, it, it, it contains a, the, the perfect life that he was looking for. A life that fulfilled every righteous requirement. Now what does that have to do with you and I? That's good news for Jesus. He passed his tests. Well, what about us? We failed our test. How does that help us? Well, we need to learn to use the blood. In the scriptures, it, there's a distinction. Uh, Pastor Margaret, what, what time is this service done? What's that? What time, is, what time does the service end? Uh, 10. 10. 10.30, okay. So, in Scripture, there's a distinction between the shed blood and the sprinkled blood. The shedding of blood, Scripture says, was for the forgiveness of sins. So that, that's what satisfies the Father. The shed blood is for the Father. When Moses would do sacrifices, what he would do is he would take half the blood and pour it on the altar. The other half of the blood was put in bowls. And those bowls then were used to sprinkle the blood. He, would, he sprinkled the blood on the people when he read them the covenant. He sprinkled the blood on the priests to sanctify them. He sprinkled the blood on the law to sanctify the law. He sprinkled blood on the utensils of the temple because sprinkled blood was used for sanctification, to sanctify something, to set it apart unto God. So the shed blood gave us forgiveness, but the sprinkled blood gave us sanctification. So this old covenant idea is, is a, it's kind of a mysterious thing, but you look in the new covenant, and in Hebrews it talks about the sprinkling of blood. So let's look at Hebrews 9 again. Listen to what it says. Hebrews 9. Look at verse 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so we have that that idea of the sprinkling. Now look at 9.14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? How does the blood of Jesus cleanse my conscience? Look at, look at uh, ver chapter 10, verse 2. Otherwise, okay, he's talking about how the blood of Jesus was offered, or not the blood of goats and bulls in the Old Testament was offered all the time, all the time. Every year they would offer it, the sacrificial lamb at the Passover. It says uh, that it could never, by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly over year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would not have stopped off being offered. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt the guilt for their sins. So scripture says that we use the blood to cleanse ourselves of a guilty conscience. To cleanse our hearts of a guilty conscience. Here's the dilemma. There are a lot of people who live as born again believers. They're forgiven but they don't feel forgiven. Let me put it this way. Man had two problems. He had legal guilt. We offended God's holy law. But we also had another problem. We had psychological guilt. We felt shame and guilt and unworthy to enter. And there are a lot of believers, a lot of Christians in churches all over the world that understand that God now, that they're now saved, that they're going to heaven, but they still live with a guilty conscience. And if we don't know how to apply the blood to our own conscience, we'll never be able to use the blood against the enemy. Because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. And what he tries to do is remind you about your past to keep you out of the throne room. You see, if the enemy can't keep you from going to heaven, he wants to keep you out of God's presence until you get there. He wants to render you ineffective this side of heaven. And he does that through guilt, through shame, 
He reminds you about your past. And if we don't know how to apply the blood to our own heart, we will become, we'll succumb to the enemy's guilt trips, his accusations, and we'll never feel quite worthy to come into God's presence. Now the irony is, is this, that it's the most sincere believers that are the most susceptible to condemnation. If you are sincere, you are more susceptible to condemnation than to someone that's not sincere about their faith. Because if you're not sincere, you don't care if you fail. But if you really want to please God, when you fail, it breaks your heart. Because you know it breaks God's heart. And the enemy loves to leverage that pain, that guilt, to make you feel unworthy and to keep you outside of God's presence. Remember years ago, I was, when I worked at Teen Challenge, we used to have a Bible study every morning with the staff. And then, the, well, the students read their Bible, and then we'd go up and have chapel together. And uh, we were discussing the book of Jonah. And uh, one of our staff members said that the reason Jonah didn't want to preach to the Ninevites was because of their tremendous cruelty. And he began to talk about different forms of torture the Ninevites used to utilize. And, and when I'm, I'm listening to this early in the morning, and I thought, why are you telling us this? And uh, he said one of the things they used to do is they would play a game with their captives. They would tell them, okay, listen. It, they, sometimes they'd skin people alive. Other times they'd say, okay, we're going to allow you to run across this field. If you can get to the end of the field before we catch up to you, then you're a free man. But if you can't, then, you know, it's going to be skinned alive. Well, they're, they're, they'd take off running. What they didn't know is that the soldiers had already made a bet at how far that man could run without his head. And so they would get on their horse and they'd have a long sword and they'd come up behind him and just snip his head off. And he, his body would run for a few steps and then fall and they'd laugh and they thought that was hilarious. Well, when this gentleman was telling us that, I thought, why are you telling us this? And... There was no application. He just told us this strange story. So later on, I went up to chapel, and as I was worshiping the Lord, I can tell you right where I was standing, the Lord spoke to me very clearly, and he told me, that's exactly what the enemy does with you, Dave. He tries to separate you from the head and makes bets on how long you can run. You see, Jesus is the head. He's our source. If you get locked out of God's presence through condemnation, it's like unplugging a, an electric utensil from the source. It's got all the equipment, but it can't run. You and I have to be in his presence. We've got to be plugged into him. We've got to have that relationship with him. And so the enemy's strategy is to cause guilt in your heart to keep you separated from God. And if you're sincere, you're more susceptible. That is, if you're sincere... And you don't understand the gospel. Because I'm here to preach the gospel to you this morning. If you are not sincere and you don't understand the gospel, you don't care. But if you are sincere and you understand the gospel, then you're not going to be susceptible to the enemy. You see, we need to take and apply the blood of Jesus to our heart. Matthew In, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, there's the passage... That's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus preached this message a number of times because we also see it show up another time. He was, he was on a plane, uh, a, a big field, and so there were several times he'd preach this. Uh, matter of fact, it even says, and so Jesus sat down teaching. And the word teaching has the idea of he taught it again and again. In that body of teaching, those three chapters, he says something very strange to us. He said, when you're on your way to the judge, agree with your adversary. Agree with your adversary on the way to the judge. He seems to assume that any time we go to court, we'd be guilty. He's not talking about a human court. He's talking about as we go before the throne, the judge of all the earth, when our adversary, the devil, begins to accuse us, 
He said, agree with him. Why would we agree with the adversary? Because as long as you argue your own righteousness, you are susceptible to the condemnation of the enemy. You will never be righteous enough to enter God's presence. You're never going to pray enough, fast enough, not do the wrong things enough to be able to enter God's presence by your own righteousness. You'll always have to enter by the blood of the Lamb. And so what Jesus is saying is when you're on your way to the judge, well, in, in Revelation, the passage we just, we just read in Revelation, it says that the, uh, the accuser of the brethren accuses us before the throne day and night. How does the devil have access to the throne? He's been thrown down. How does he get to the throne? It's not that he comes to the throne. It's as you and I are on our way to the throne. We're there to go to meet with our Father, to worship, to pray. While we're on our way, he accuses us so that we'll feel unworthy to enter in. That's his strategy. So Jesus gives us the solution. Agree with your adversary on your way to the judge. This is what you tell him. That's right, devil. I'm not righteous enough. I do fail. I agree with that. But the good news for me is that I'm not going to enter by my own righteousness. I'm going to enter by the blood of the Lamb. Because Jesus fulfilled all of righteousness and pulled the rug right out underneath your feet. You have no accusation. Because I've stepped off the ground of my righteousness and I've stepped onto the ground of His righteousness. And it's in this way that we apply the blood of Jesus to our own conscience. If we believe that we have to work for favor, we will be susceptible to the enemy. And God loves you enough that he will allow you to fail every time you do it. Because he wants to break us of trusting in ourselves and cause us to have our trust in Jesus. So the blood of Jesus satisfies the Father. The reason the Father values the blood is because it fulfilled every righteous requirement. The life is in the blood and the life that is in Jesus' blood is a life that fulfilled every righteous requirement God had for man. The way it works for us is we begin to understand. We cleanse our conscience. How? By understanding. We don't enter the throne room, we don't under the Holy of Holies, we don't enter God's presence based on our own righteousness. We enter based on His righteousness. And when we understand why God values the blood, we can then understand how we use it. And we, I remember when I was first born again, I got saved. I was a homeless alcoholic. It was back in 1983. I was living on the streets, I was a demonized mess. I was a demonized young man and God radically saved me, but I was still a mess even after I got saved. The, the woman who led me to the Lord gave me $60 so I could buy a new study Bible because I was going to go to Teen Challenge. They were going to help me get off of drugs. And rather than buying a Bible, and 60 bucks back in 83 was a lot of money. It ain't as much anymore, but it was a lot of money. And I took that $60 and I went and bought a keg of beer. And I sat there and I drank that keg with a bunch of bikers. And you know what I did? I wept. And I sat there speaking in tongues, crying as I'm getting drunk. I'm sure all these bikers are looking at me thinking, you're one weird little dude, but you got beer, so I'll hang out with you. You see, the only difference initially in my life when I got saved, the only difference from before I got saved to after I got saved was before I got saved, I, did, I loved sin. I was pursuing it with my whole heart. After I got saved, I was still finding myself falling into it all the time. But I, something in me said, God, I don't want to live this way. There was, there was a seed of righteousness that had been planted in me that was saying, I don't want to live this way anymore. My spirit man, even though it was just a little embryonic baby, it said, no, <laughs> as my big old fleshly man drug it into sin. And, but over time, it began to grow. 
And when I got saved, man, I wanted to serve Jesus. I was serious. I didn't want to go back to what I was. I couldn't believe. See, my dad's a pastor. I was raised in church. I was a spirit-filled, tongue-talking little boy. And I turned my back on all of it and went into deep, deep darkness. And the fact that God took me back still overwhelms me. I still can't believe it. So I, I didn't ever want to hurt his heart. I was trying to be righteous. I wanted to live for him. And I kept failing and failing. And after I stopped doing the things I shouldn't do, I, I, I still couldn't get done all the things I knew I needed to do. And I got on this treadmill of trying to be righteous. I would get up at 4 a.m. and go over to the church at 4.30 and pray for two hours and I would fast and I would make a commitment to read my Bible an hour a day and all this stuff. And finally, I remember about five years into walking with the Lord, I hit, I just hit a wall. And I remember I was in Bible school and I was laying on the floor and I said, God, I'm done. I can't do this. I can't, I can't live for you like I should. I guess I only had five years of righteousness in me. That's, that's how messed up my theology was. I thought, Lord, I can never be what you want me to be. I thought I'd quit, I'd get out of Bible school because I'd be a fraud as a pastor, but my bills are paid and I got meals to eat here and I got a roof over my head, so I guess I'll stay. And in that darkness, the Lord spoke to me and said, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he took me on a journey teaching me about the blood. In the Around that same period of time, I was in worship one day and all of a sudden I saw a vision and I was standing outside this room and I could see in the room through the door and the floor was as far as the eye could see. It was a massive room and it looked like glass and I knew in my spirit, it's the throne room. But I felt I'm unworthy to go in. And then I looked at the threshold down on the floor and there was blood all over the threshold. And the Lord told me, the only way in is through the blood. See, we're to come boldly before the throne of grace to receive grace to do the right things and mercy for when we've done the wrong things. But if we don't understand that we can come in through the blood of the Lamb, we end up putting ourselves in the penalty box. And we get this strange thinking that, oh, I'll just, I'll stay out of his presence for three days and then God will kind of forget and then I can go back in. Like I've got to sit in the corner for a few days. I'm going to tell you, one of the, one of the marks of maturity is how quickly you can get up when you failed. It's because you've begun to understand the blood. And when we fail, we need to get up and say, God, I just proved all over again what your word says about me. In me, there's nothing good, but I'm made righteous in you. And I'm going to enter by the blood of the Lamb. God wants to set our consciences free. Too many believers know heaven is their destination, but they live disconnected from God under a, a low, a low, low simmering guilt in their soul because they never understood how to apply the blood. When I, when I first began to realize this all those years ago, I used to go through this mental exercise and I would, I would stand before the Lord or I'd be praying or I'd be worshiping and in my mind I'd say, God, I know the one requirement you have for me to come into your presence is a perfect life. And I don't have that in and of myself but I know I have it in you. And I would picture myself as the high priest would bring in the bowl of blood. And I would picture myself with the bowl of Jesus' blood. And I would picture myself handing it to the Father. And the Father would say, come in, come in. And I had to retrain my thinking, 
retrain my heart. When we understand this, the enemy's accusations have nothing to sink into. If he tries to accuse me, hey, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not. I don't have righteousness in my own. That's, that's an irrelevant argument. You're arguing over here, but I ain't standing over there. I'm standing here. And it disarms the enemy of his greatest power, that of accusation. I'm going to ask you to stand, and I want to pray over you this morning. If you struggle with guilt from time to time, I'm, if you struggle with those feelings of guilt and just not being worthy enough, when I struggled with those, it wasn't like I was living in sin. My life was clean. But the enemy just kept writing me about the things I wasn't doing. And it kept me out of God's presence. If that's you this morning, I just want you to raise your hand. You, you realize, man, I struggle with guilt. I want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Father, I just pray for these this morning. Lord, I ask that you'd open the eyes of their understanding so that they would know the value of your blood, that they would understand it and be able to utilize it in cleansing their own heart and disarming the enemy. Lord, I ask that you'd help them to grow in that. And, and Father, even give them their, their own way to reprogram their minds around this vital truth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. It was good to be with you this morning.